Well, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us for the third part of Owen Mitchell's webinar series focusing on paediatric neuropsychology. Uh, I'm Laura Middleton Gerrard. I'm a serious injury partner in our London office, although currently uh, operating from my living room, as many of you uh, will also be. Um, living room, which just so happens to be I am branded uh, from floor to ceiling. So you can tell that I'm, I'm very much missing the office uh, at the moment. Well, look, before I kick off um, today's webinar, I do need to go through some uh, housekeeping. Um, so um, uh, there will be um, a, a Q&A function. Uh, we have had quite a few questions come through already, uh, so please do keep them uh, coming. So you'll see there's a Q&A function on the screen and we will answer uh, those questions uh, later on during the networking uh, session. Now, I should say that when you submit questions, please do include your name and email address, because if for some reason we do not get to your question, we can respond directly to you after the event. Um, as you know, or you should know, we are holding a 30 minute breakout session once the webinar has concluded. And I would really urge you to join us for uh, those discussions. Professor Ingram Wright has kindly agreed uh, to join us um, afterwards. The session will be uh, facilitated by my colleague Rhys Dando uh, and uh, it is likely to be a really vibrant discussion, uh, especially with the topic that we are dealing with uh, today. Uh, now, as with all of our past uh, webinars, this is a virtual event and we will be recording it. The recording will be sent out afterwards. Uh, and I should say that towards the end of the session, we will be posting a feedback link and please do take two minutes uh, to complete that so that uh, we can take your feedback on board. If there are other topics that you would like us to deal with, that is the place to flag it up to us. Now, today's topic is uh, about teenage behaviour and TBI. Now, puberty, social factors, ongoing maturation come into play for a young person at that stage of their life. But what happens if that young person has also had a TBI and has to contend with that on top of everything else? How do you support them in the most appropriate way if you're a parent, if you're a clinician? And it is very much a challenging topic if ever there was one. And it is one that I come across time and time again in the cases involving children or young adults that have been injured and who have a, a legal claim as a result of their injuries. Uh, and before I pass over to Professor Ingram Wright, I wanted to share uh, an example that always springs to my mind when this topic comes up. Um, I took over a case um, a few years ago from other solicitors. It was a young boy at the time and his mom. They were injured in a road traffic collision. Uh, they were both injured, but him especially so with a severe TBI. Um, I thought the SI guide should apply to this type of case because of the injuries and the guide essentially is a way if you adhere to it to generate interim payments throughout the life of a claim to fund rehabilitation and that worked very well we you know, secured around half a million in terms of interim payment to ensure that he had access to case managers ot neuropsychology vocational ot etc it also means that you do have to have what we call road mapping meetings between claimant solicitors and defendant solicitors, some more pleasant than, than others, um, but it, it is quite important uh, to be able to discuss informally matters relating to claims, timetable, etc. But during one such meeting involving my, my young lad, the defendant solicitors explained to me that, yes, my client had sustained a severe TBI, but what teenager had never got up late, what teenager had never left uh, his house, leaving the front door open, had never left the hob on, had never lost his keys, his wallet, uh, had never forgotten an MOT, had never got fired from work, had never sustained a breakup that would lead him um, to have suicidal ideation. And the list went on and on. Uh, needless to say, that argument was not successful. Um, and this was rebutted through clinical evidence from the MDT in this case, which was brilliant. 
showing the patterns of behaviour. Um, and from witness statements from the family, the friends and even the employer uh, highlighting the difficulties. And all of that was needed to challenge uh, the assumptions uh, that the defendant solicitors were putting across. But it, it, it does show two things for me. Um, how little some insurers think of teenagers as a whole, um, and also possibly some misunderstanding about the impact of a TBI on maturing brains. So having said all of that, I am really grateful uh, that our speaker today, Professor Ingram Wright, has agreed to expand on this very topic for us. Uh, and uh, so Professor Ingram Wright, bear with me, I will read out a, a very short summary uh, of your uh, bio. Uh, you are a consultant neuropsychologist and head of psychology services at the University of Bristol and Western NHS Trust. Uh, you've worked as a neuropsychologist at uh, several tertiary neuroscience centres uh, since uh, qualifying in 2000. Your clinical role involves assessment and intervention for children and young adults who have an acquired brain injury. You've published numerous studies. Uh, you regularly present at international conferences on aspects of child brain injury and now even IM webinars. Uh, you contribute uh, to uh, teaching programmes at UCL, University of Bristol and uh, Cardiff. Uh, and then I'll reel off your BPS um, uh, positions. You've been appointed inaugural chair of the Faculty of Paediatric Neuropsychology, uh, uh, Chief Assessor in Neuropsychology, uh, Chair of the Clinical uh, Neuropsychological Qualifications Board and most recently Chair of the uh, um, uh, Division of Neuropsychology Professional Standards Unit. So in short, you're the man for the job at hand today. Uh, and on that note, uh, I will pass on uh, over to you uh, and um, um, I will join you again for uh, wrapping up after your presentation. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much, Laura, for that kind introduction and thank you to Owen Mitchell for the invitation to speak today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to you. Unfortunately, I can't see all of you, but um, I, I hope that the discussion um, and some of the material that I'm presenting are of interest to you and address some of the themes that I suppose concern all of us around understanding um, teenage behaviour in the context of brain injury. I'm specifically focusing on the impact of traumatic brain injuries here, but some of what I have to say applies to other forms of acquired brain injury during childhood. So um, thanks to Laura's introduction, you already know who I am and you already know the topic. So can we have the next slide, please? So I just want to say a little bit more about where I work. Um, it sets the context for the clinical perspective that I'm going to take today. So I'm based in Bristol, as Laura has uh, um, told you. Um, our services regionally cover the whole of the southwest in terms of major trauma services and east as far as Oxford and Swindon. Um, you can see on the right side of this slide a, a helipad which illustrates the, I suppose, the acuity or the critical nature of, I suppose, of transfers to hospital in terms of dealing with trauma. Uh, we also run a, incidentally, run a regional um, epilepsy surgery service, hence the, um, the picture in the centre there. Can we have the, the next slide, please? Um, as well as being a clinical neuropsychologist, I'm also a parent, a uh, father of three daughters. Um, the picture on the left, I suppose, um, illustrates the kind of aspirations I had naively as a parent of three daughters as to what family life would look like, gathered around the piano, learning our scales and playing the violin. Um, my daughters are now aged 18, 14 and 10. And I, some days I feel like I have three teenagers in the house, even though I only have two and a half. Um, the illustration the painting on the right illustrates um, the picture, I think, which reflects more of the reality of the of the mood in the household, particularly during COVID. I'm sure like many of you, we've experienced our challenges um, and I'm going to keep those in mind today because although thankfully none of my children have suffered uh, brain injury, it isn't as though parenting isn't without its challenges nonetheless. And those are some of the important themes that um, we're going to talk about today. So can I have the next slide, please? Um, it's helpful uh, to define adolescence. I'm going to talk about adolescence rather than um, uh, teenagers as such, but there is an overlap. But the definition of adolescence, which you can see at the bottom uh, right of the slide, is that it starts with the biological, hormonal and physical changes of puberty and ends at an age when an individual attains a stable, 
independent role in society. I've borrowed this from um, Sarah Blakemore, although it's a more universal um, uh, definition that's used. Uh, it usually gets a laugh at the end because um, the idea that all of us have yet attained a stable independent role in society is, is somewhat challenging usually to a to a mixed audience. There are a number of other quotes on this slide. I can just draw your attention to uh, the top one. Um, sorry, the, the, the second uh, to the top, which is uh, from Socrates. Uh, describing adolescence as follows. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority, show disrespect for elders, love chatter in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their household, and they no longer rise when elders enter the room. Rousseau, uh, an 18th century philosopher, said we are born, so to speak, twice over, born into existence and born into life, born a human being and born a man. Uh, and if you thought that this was getting rather heavy, I've just included a quote from Quizlet, which is a flashcard based sort of revision uh, platform, which says that researchers suggest that adolescence undergoes three primary developmental stages. An early adolescence, a middle adolescence and late adolescence. So well, well done researchers there for classifying those three stages, a beginning, a middle and an end. Can I have the next slide, please? So my plan today is to talk and to, to lay some foundations because I think the foundations are very important. Although I do have a lot of slides on this, I'm intending to go through them um, briefly just to give you an orientation to the structural changes that occur in the brain and characterize adolescent phases of development. Also to look at functional changes. So how the brain is used and um, what we know about metabolism within different brain areas that's linked with adolescent behavior and also think about hormonal influences on brain function. I then want to move on to talk about brain injury risks specifically, so which children are at risk of having traumatic brain injury specifically, and how this creates a problem for us in terms of the timing of the onset of brain injury related disturbance in cognition and behaviour, and the kind of growing emergence of behavioural challenges that characterise adolescence. Um, and then I want to finally wrap up with um, thinking about adolescent behaviour, the relationship to brain injury, the key question here, but specifically in terms of what we can, how we can use the information that I've presented to inform both prognosis and treatment and intervention. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so this slide illustrates um, uh, neuronal density in the brain. So um, our heads grow, our head grows particularly rapidly during the early phases of, uh, of our development as, as human infants. Um, we have a fixed number of neurons, around 86 billion neurons, but the density within the brain changes over time. And what you can see here, which is important to point out, is the changes that occur between one year and 28 years are not in fact pathological, but are about pruning of synapses within the brain. So although there's a fixed number of neurons, uh, the pathways are pruned such that connections within the brain are actually more efficient at 28 years than they would be at one year of age. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, in terms of anatomical markers of brain development, what I wanted to illustrate with this slide is that there are various markers of maturity of the brain. So this slide is showing that neuronal and synaptic density, um, but there are other markers that show a more protracted period of development over time. So myelination, a process that I'll describe in some detail over the next few slides, is a much more protracted period. So it extends over 20 years or more of, of life. Whereas changes in synaptic density, for example, occur over the first six to 24 months. This um, last, you can't see the, the um, uh, detail here, but I'm not expecting you to, um, is also showing that there are electrophysiological or electrical changes in the brain that mature over time. The point of this slide and what I often use it to illustrate is the rate at which the brain matures depends not on a single marker of maturity, but on interpretation of a complex constellation of different ways of describing brain maturity. OK, can we have the next slide? So this is another sort of rather cartoonish way of describing what I've already said. So at birth, we have the same number of neurons, but the connections are rather sparse. Uh, by the age of six years of age, we found uh, numerous connections which reflect experience um, and um, I suppose document within the structure of the brain the learning that we have um, um, made structural within our brain systems. By the age of 14 years we've begun to prune 
some of that structure to take out some of the pathways that are less important to us and to reinforce transmission within pathways that are much more important in delivering our end goals. Can I have the next slide, please? This is a slide showing the myelination process. So if you look first of all at the X axis, what you can see is age in years. And if you look at these curves that you can see illustrated that are labeled prefrontal, parietal and temporal and sensory motor cortex. What you're looking at here is synaptogenesis within the brain. So the formation of synapses and then subsequent pruning. That's that arc that you can see. Initial growth of synapses and subsequent pruning to make those brain systems more efficient. And you can see that pruning takes place in a non-uniform way. So the sensory motor cortex is the first to grow and to be pruned, followed by parietal and temporal areas, and finally by prefrontal cortex. So when we think about brain development, and specifically when we're thinking about adolescence, you can see that the development of the prefrontal cortex in terms of synaptogenesis and subsequent pruning is amongst the last to develop. And it coincides with a period of development during um, early puberty. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this slide essentially shows the same kind of thing, and so do the next few slides, so I'm going to go over them rather rapidly. But what this slide shows is the brain turning blue or purplish, and that reflects in terms of how the, um, uh, the, 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 the slide is put together. This cartoon shows an increase in white matter within the brain. So it's a reduction in gray matter and increase in white matter. So the brain being comprised of gray matter and white matter as the white matter increases, this reflects the myelination process within, within brain pathways. And you, what you can see, if you look carefully, is that the areas of the brain that are turning blue, which reflect an increase in white matter, is not happening uniformly. There are various parts of the brain, um, and if you know your brain anatomy, you'll spot that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this part sitting over the, the just, just sitting behind your temples, um, is, is one of the last areas of brain development to reach full maturity in terms of in terms of white matter development. Next slide, please. Uh, this is looking at the structure of the brain in slices. So if you imagine uh, you're looking down at the top of the brain um, and the slices on the right are closest to the top, the slice on the left, uh, an axial slice is closest to the middle of the brain. And what you can see is some blue and green areas um, shaded in on top of a brain here. And what these areas, what these coloured areas show are the contrast between the juvenile brain, between young adults and adolescents and middle aged adults. And what you can see in blue is white matter pathways within the brain that are developing between adolescence and mature adulthood. Um, the green patterns in the brain are reductions in frontal grey matter, so corresponding increases in frontal white matter. So essentially what we're looking at here is the connectivity between frontal and subcortical structures and other areas of the brain that occur between adolescence and full maturity in adulthood. So you can see the majority of the development in terms of connectivity in blue and you can see global changes in white matter density within the brain in green is distributed disproportionately towards the front of the brain, the frontal lobes. Next slide, please. Uh, this is rather redundant, this slide, but just to remind you that what we're talking about here is an infant that is born essentially with a number of connections within the brain that can be modified through experience, such as reading, to the point where we reach a fully fledged and mature um, adolescent who's got all the connections that she needs in order to be able to function normally within the world. OK, next slide, please. Adolescence is a period of turbulence, and I've been asked to talk specifically about adolescence. This is an excellent sort of infographic from UNICEF, which talks about two periods of vulnerability, but also opportunity for us in terms of how we support children and nurture them in terms of healthy brain development. I started off my um, interest in developmental uh, psychology, being particularly interested in early years development, so between not and three years. Um, and certainly in terms of um, governmental programs such as Sure Start that was introduced, this is seen as a, as a characteristic period of opportunity for us to intervene and support individuals in terms of brain development and increasing their life chances. But it's equally recognised and what's illustrated here by UNICEF is that period between 9 and 14 years is another opportunity for us to nurture children's brains and make sure that they're fit for purpose in terms of their roles in adulthood. Um, I'm going to go on to talk about infancy because I think one of the things about 
the contrast between infancy and adolescent development is that there are periods of regulation within infancy that are just as challenging as those periods within adoles adolescent. And in terms of our understanding of both beha behaviour and in terms of aspects of brain structure and function, they both illustrate very similar themes that have very different behavioural endpoints and evolutionary end goals. So can I have the next slide, please? Now, this is a rather jokey slide. Um, what, what, if I was able to see your faces, I would probably see probably a look of consternation, some surprise that I'd chosen to include pictures of excavators in my um, slideshow. But what I want to illustrate is in terms of sensation seeking, um, something that adolescents are often accused of, there's no greater sensation for a young infant or a preschool child than seeing a bright yellow digger working in a field or on a building site, and they get very excited about these things. And the point I want to make is that sensation seeking or the brain's response to sensation is not something that's uniquely adolescent, but it has a different purpose in adolescent from the one that you'd see occurring in young childhood. Can we have the next slide, please? One more digger, just for those who are digger enthusiasts. What this slide shows is an infant um, seeking a different form of sensation, seeking to look at his or her mother's face. Um, it's a really important feature of early infant development. This is the kind of sensation that infants are really keen to, 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 to have in their lives, right? So much so that if you show a newborn infant um, a, a, a paddle with three black dots on it, it will look at it as if it's a face. We are pre-wired to take information from faces, seek out that sensation and use it to form connections within our brain that allow us to develop rudimentary social functioning. Next slide, please. So what I've illustrated here, well, I haven't illustrated, I didn't do these paintings. The right on the one on the right is a, an extract from a Dali painting illustrating adolescence and the painting on the left is one of a breastfeeding mother. There is an evolutionary advantage to the kind of behaviours that we see in infancy and in adolescence. And there's an evolutionary advantage to the kind of sensations and the kind of parameters that we're particularly sensitive to. Um, there was an excellent programme, I don't know if anybody was listening to BBC Radio 4 last night with Amal Rajan was talking about rethinking education. Uh, and there was a challenge to the notion that infancy is a period that we should focus on because this is where we nurture children's brains and this is the period where we set children up for life. That needs to be balanced out with a recognition that during adolescence, we are um, poorly serving our adolescents in some ways by misunderstanding what it is that's going on for them behaviourally, emotionally, cognitively and in terms of brain development. So I would commend that programme. There's a link on the screen uh, if you want to have a look at that. Next slide, please. So there's something going on in adolescence. So we're skipping from infancy and the kind of predispositions that infants bring to the world to think about what is it that adolescents seek to do that provide, you know, often presents us with challenges, but has some, um, we, we, sorry, we have some understanding of this. So this is a study that was done uh, by Smith uh, looking at uh, risk taking during a simulated driving task, um, a stoplight task. So you have to see, oh, there's actually a chicken game that's um, presented in the, in the slide here. And we're looking at the, the extent to which young people will take risks with their driving. And what they do is they contrast in an experiment the child undertaking or the young person undertaking or the adult undertaking this task with or without groups of their peers. And what you find is that adolescents are much more sensitive to the presence of a social audience around their risk taking. So adolescents are much more likely to drive in a way that, that, that suffers manifest risk taking when they have the presence of uh, a, one of their peers. Okay, this is less pronounced in young adults and largely absent in, 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 in adults. Next slide, please. This is a slide, and again, as with many of my slides and themes in this talk, I mentioned Sarah Blakemore earlier. Um, she highlights this in, in one of her TED Talks and talks to the Royal Society, which is, which is a, an animal model, which is not irrelevant to understanding adolescence, although um, mice enjoy a period of about six days of adolescence, so it's blissfully short. But if you look at um, uh, mice, juvenile mice ingesting alcohol, the same kind of principles apply. That, that juvenile mice will drink more alcohol in the presence of other mice than they would when they were alone. And that contrast isn't apparent in adult mice. Uh, 
So there's evidence from animal studies of this kind that you see the same kind of social facilitation of risk taking behavior uh, in mice. Next slide, please. Uh, this is some data from um, studies of human behavior and ratings of human behavior across the childhood and adolescent lifespan. The top graph is showing age on the x-axis um, and showing um, sensation seeking behavior. So you can see an arc from uh, limited sensation seeking behavior in young children, reaching a maximum around 18, 19 and then reducing as you enter adulthood. And if you look at the bottom of the slide, what you can see is corresponding capacity for self-regulation. So this grows over the ages 10 to about 22, but doesn't reach its peak until about 24 or 25 years. And if you put those two together, what you see is an emphasis on sensation seeking, which is not matched by capacity for self-regulation. And this is the where the risks of adolescence are manifest. I have to say, and before I move on, in case the sort of penny hasn't dropped with everybody, there are clear evolutionary advantages in terms of passing on your genes, in impressing others socially, pairing up with individuals, mating, producing children at a stage that may involve some risk. Clearly, it's not what we all have in mind in terms of end goals for our children, but in evolutionary terms, there is a purpose, if you like, at some level to risk taking of a certain form that may well impress your peers and mean that your chances of being able to pass on your genes are increased. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, this is another experimental task, and I'm just um, illustrating sort of behavioural examples of the kind of risks that adolescents have been um, seen to take in very sort of contrived and experimental um, uh, scenarios. So this is a, a very simple card game where you turn over one of the cards and immediately you're greeted with either a reward, so cash reward, uh, which is notional, um, or, 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 or a loss. And the, there are good decks and bad decks. Obviously, they aren't labelled, so the child doesn't know which ones are good and which ones are bad. And this is called the Iowa gambling task. And essentially what's found is that in terms of um, the decks that the individuals are drawn to, adolescents are much more likely to take higher risks. So they will turn over the cards within the decks that have higher gains, but also much higher losses. And in terms of the outcome, they are likely to lose more money than they gain, but they are so sensitive to the high levels of reward within the bad decks that initially at least, they ignore the consequences of turning over cards in that deck, and they are so focused on the high rewards that come from those decks. This, um, in terms of um, over time, the individuals um, and the adolescents are particularly good at learning to gravitate towards the good decks, but in terms of their initial behavior, they would largely be sensitive to high reward. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to illustrate this, it's sort of bridging back to the way that we would look at um, behaviour um, in inhibition. If you try and read the ink colour of these words as they come on the screens, so the first one is green, uh, that's red, that's blue, and here's a control. So this is a lot easier, green, red, and blue. What I'm illustrating here is a standard way in which we would look at, thank you, a standard way in which we would look at inhibitory control, the ability to stop yourself from reading the word in order to be able to perform a task. Now, one of the points I think it's really important to make is that if you look at all, all the tasks that I've described so far, they're not necessarily tasks that young children would be able to perform. And so it's quite normal to see manifestations, I suppose, of poor regulatory behaviour in very young children um, coupled with increasingly mature performance in late adolescence and early adulthood. Um, I did a study um, which I'm particularly proud of um, back in 2003, looking at trying to come up with a, a version of the Stroop test uh, that we could do with young children. And what might be nice actually um, is to have a look at the video of this. So what I'm going to do while describing the task, if you just have a brief look at that, I think we've got a Thais, we've got to now just um, set up the video. Um, uh, what you'll see in this video uh, if we can get that going, it just takes a couple of minutes. I'm afraid I did challenge everybody with uh, with trying to do some 
technical wizardry here, but you've heard you've heard me for a little bit, and I think it's time for a little um, a little break. Uh, I'm gonna, you're going to see a two minute video of Robert Winston on Child of Our Time using the task that I developed to look at young children's inhibitory control with a task that's been designed explicitly for this purpose. So can we play the video? So it's just a couple of minutes. There's a famous test which measures how well people can focus on one thing at a time. In this test, what I have to do is to ignore what the word says and say the color it's written in. Red. Green. Yellow. Blue. Yellow. I find that surprisingly difficult. It's not so much about how quick you are, but more about how easily you're confused when the word disagrees with the color. Being good at this test shows that you can resist distraction, a vital life skill. Our children can't read. So to do the test on them, we showed them some animals which all have the wrong heads. <coughs> the children have to ignore the weird heads and identify the animal's body. We can tell how distractible the children are by the length of time it takes them to recognize the animal. Some were pretty quick Duck. and not at all distractible. Duck. And some were slow. Um... William was the most distractible of all the children. So what about Ethan? Ethan is our top scorer on this task. What this shows is that he's brilliant at focusing his attention on one thing. The question is, what will he decide to focus on? Thank you, Tice. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed that video. It's an illustration, I suppose, of a way in which we can design a, a sensitive behavioural measure of features of inhibitory control that's particularly applicable in young children. Thank you, Tice. Um, when tasks of a similar nature have been used to look at um, in functional imaging studies, so these are studies looking at metabolism within the brain, what you can see highlighted here, and I won't go into detail, um, I need to um, speed up a little bit, I think, um, but what I, you can look at these slides at your leisure and the references are available for you to have a look in, in great detail at this. What you should be able to see is that although we think of response inhibition and behavioural regulation as being frontally mediated tasks, that's it, that is tasks that use the frontal lobes and the integrity of the frontal lobes to subserve healthy performance, there are a wide array of brain areas that are involved in supporting behavioural regulation. So on the left, you can see cognitive inhibition. Yes, you can see some frontal areas, but you can also see some extra frontal recruitment and involvement in terms of metabolic activity. The same on the right with regard to response inhibition. Next slide, please. And in terms of emotional inhibition, so similar tasks, but involving emotional decision making, emo responding to emotional stimuli. And not surprisingly here in amygdala, the amygdala activation, which is central to uh, regulating our emotional responses. But you can also see the occipital gyrus in terms of perceptual involvement. So the information that's coming into our eyes and being projected to the back of the brain, into the visual cortex, also being utilized to subserve um, accurate performance on this task. Next slide, please. These are rather older studies, but they make a point, which is that what adults are doing with their frontal lobes, there's reasonable evidence that when children are performing inhibitory control tasks, they're using other parts of their brain to achieve the same end point. So although their frontal lobes are relatively immature, 
they're not necessarily the only vehicle for deployment in terms of being able to achieve the same kind of behavioral endpoint. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, this is showing the same kind of thing. So it's just showing that there is an association of increasing frontal use of the brain areas with, de with development. So children are using more posterior parietal areas and occipital areas at a perceptual level to look at, if you like, or pay attention to aspects of the stimulus that allow them to give the correct response. I don't know if you noticed in the video, but there was one child that was holding his hand over the top of the, the animal's face so that he could read, if you like, the animal's body. And that's exactly what I think is happening here, that we can see much more primary perceptual control. So a, a, a gateway to a response that is being um, facilitated at the brain level, which is very different to the adult form of behavioral regulation. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to say something about hormones. This is a great paper, and I'm sorry I haven't put the full title there, but you can um, you can have a look at this. It's a really nice readable paper, and it includes a beautiful model around hormonal changes and an influence on behavioural regulation. And what I'll point out here is that if you look at the top of the slide, you'll see that there are some aspects of uh, behavioural regulation that are independent of pubertal and hormonal influences. Sorry, the, the top left is dependent and the right is independent. So at the neurobiological level, reward sensitivity is dependent upon pubertal and hormonal influences, but cognitive control as a construct is not dependent upon puberty. Sensation seeking at the psychological level is dependent upon pubertal influences, but self-regulation as a construct is not. And what the authors are trying to illustrate here is that we need to think about risk taking as a constellation of both psychological and neurobiological features of our behavior, some of which are dependent upon puberty, but other aspects are independent of puberty and adolescence itself. Of course, all risk taking takes place within a context, which is the point that they make in terms of the illustration at the bottom of the diagram. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go on to talk about features of adolescent behavior. Uh, I've already illustrated some of them, but I want to particularly think about the relationship to brain injury prognosis, treatment and intervention. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to read all of this out. Um, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, but there's a there's a beautiful illustration of um, uh, this. The, the one on the top right is a rather famous uh, illustration of the sort of egocentricity of um, teenage diaries. Um, I went to the art centre by myself in yellow cords and a blouse. Ian was there, but he didn't speak to me. Got rhymed put in my handbag from someone who's apparently got a crush on me. It's Nicholas, I think. Uh, man landed on moon. Sarah Jane Blakemore uses this as an illustration and it's a very famous uh, letter to the Guardian. I picked out um, um, Tracy Thorne's uh, recent um, novel, uh, biographical novel, Another Planet, um, which illustrates the absence of activity in adolescence. Tried to get some black trousers, but couldn't get any nice ones. Tried to go to the library, but it was shot. Tried to phone Deb, but no answer. And in the Guardian review of the book, it describes comfortably dull days separate into fragments of non-events. So although we think of adolescence as being about a period of sensation seeking, it's also a period where from an adolescence point of view, nothing appears to be happening. Can we just have the next slide, please? How do we judge appropriate behavior? Can we have the next slide, please? I want you to think about how old these children are. So the first illustration, James entered the clinic, sat with his mother for five minutes while we talked, but became increasingly disruptive, pulling towels from the dispenser, squeezing alcohol gel onto the floor before climbing on the couch and jumping off. Contrast this with Milo. He sat with his hood pulled over his face and responded with only single words while I talked to his father. When I asked whether he had anything, he wanted to say he mumbled F off and left the room. Now these are these illustrations of experiences that I've had as a clinician working at Bristol Children's Hospital. And I think you will be clear in being able to identify that the first one is a rather young child, the second one is a, is a much older child and adolescent. Um, and what I'm trying to illustrate here is both aspects of the behavior are inappropriate. They're not necessarily particularly extreme and they may be at the fringes of what one might regard as developmentally normal, but although they're judged as problematic by both me and the parents, um, they're not necessarily uh, yeah, clear pathological features, but they describe different ages. Next slide, please. 
So one of the key questions we need to ask ourselves is how extreme is the behavior? If a child says, I'm going to stab you and cut your head off while wielding a knife, you clearly regard that as rather extreme behavior that is probably the manifestation of something going wrong. Saying, I wish you weren't my parents. You might regard that as something uh, abnormal, certainly something that's upsetting if you are the child's parents. Um, but it's quite common in adolescence to hear these kinds of things being said, very shocking to parents, but often um, I would reassure parents that in isolation, um, such a, a remark may well not signal um, the end of the relationship. Grabbing a parent's arm with sufficient force to cause bleeding and bruising, again, may be regarded as problematic behaviour. Headbutting a carer while being transferred onto the toilet, a child who has significant physical care needs, would clearly be regarded as problematic from the, for the carer's point of view, a rather extreme behaviour that manifests clear risks. My concern, however, is that these behaviours without context are very difficult to interpret in terms of whether that severity, whether the factors which led up to the behaviour are manifest results of a head injury or some underlying pathology, or in fact can be understood as a normal expression of underlying um, uh, uh, dissatisfaction, uh, uh, poor communication, uh, pain, or, or other experiences that might be more normal. Can I have the next slide, please? If we think about age related changes in, in children's behaviour, um, this is just showing age on the x axis and an illustration of how into dinosaurs children are. It's very rare to see adolescents who are into dinosaurs. It's quite normal to see young children who are into dinosaurs and we can characterise the relatively unusual nature of the behaviour uh, according to this kind of treatment of understanding what children do at different ages. Can I have the next slide please? If we look at the same kind of trajectory, smearing faeces, playing with poo, um, we might regard some of that behaviour, particularly in young children, as being understandable, as being comprehensible. But it would be exceptionally rare to see adolescents who are smearing faeces, particularly in a way that might expose them to social uh, judgment. Can I have the next slide, please? Hitting others. Again, something that you might expect to occur quite frequently in a two or three year old, much more common in boys than in girls for various reasons. You might also see an, a, a, an amplification of that kind of behaviour in mid adolescence. And while you would want to deal with that behaviour and uh, educate children in making the right choices about how they behave, it's important to recognise that some aspect of aggression towards others, even resulting in physical aggression, may well be seen within a spectrum of risk-taking behaviour which has its place within adolescence in terms of our understanding. Next slide please. So the question is does the brain injury cause the behaviour and this is the key question for today. Um, I would argue that all brain behaviour is linked to internal features of the brain structure and function and its relationship to external factors. So all behaviour is brain related but what matters is the emphasis, um, the severity, uh, and the chronology of the emergence of that behaviour in relation to any particular brain injury. Um, so one way of understanding any type of behaviour is to use this framework of, of understanding antecedents, behaviour and consequences, often called ABC. So um, I find myself trying to um, uh, amuse the team when we're in Zoom meetings, which have all become rather dull of late. Um, so I might be finding myself in a team meeting uh, with my colleagues, that would be an antecedent. The behaviour is I tell some kind of sarcastic joke. Um, my peers laugh, maybe nervously, but I experience that as rewarding and I continue to engage in this behaviour until one of my colleagues points out that they were upset by my comments and they thought they were inappropriate. And hence I may well modify my behaviour. Next slide, please. So in terms of this is probably the most important slide in terms of addressing the central question. Um, in terms of lifetime patterns, we need to ask ourselves a set of questions. What's the age of injury? What is the form and nature of the emergence of the challenging behaviour? When was the onset of the difficult behaviour and what was its relationship to the timing of the brain injury? And were there any prior features of development which suggest this child had a pre-existing um, form of pathology or poor behaviour regulation that, that, that may have predisposed them to the injury? So that's about the chronology of emergence of the behaviour. I think we have to be aware, particularly in um, brain injury cases that we're managing clinically or in litigation, of the characterisation of a child as being an angel before and a monster afterwards, because those extreme positions are very rarely true. Personality changes I often hear about, uh, but often regard them not as a personality change, but a change in behaviour that's particularly salient to the adult that's witnessing it. I've already mentioned some features of behaviour that give us clues as to whether the brain injury is, is fundamental. When does the behaviour occur? 
When does it happen more often or less often? What does the behavior look like? What happens if you intervene and what usually happens afterwards? All of this kind of way of considering behavior allows us to look at whether there are particular antecedents, so whether uh, there are particular um, conditions in which that behavior occurs, and whether some of the consequences might be rewarding for that individual. So a typical example would be a child who throws a chair across a classroom, a very extreme behavior, but immediately the child is sent out of the classroom and able to sit quietly um, uh, in, in the lobby or outside the head teacher's office. And that may well be for that individual child who's struggling with their education, a very rewarding experience, which with high insight is very understandable in, in terms of the, the, the way in which that behavior has been shaped over time. Again, I'm wary of uh, behavior that appears to have no antecedents, which may suggest um, a, a more endogenous brain injury related um, um, cause. Um, but often when behavior is described as occurring out of the blue, if one does a little bit of gentle inquiry about in what circumstances it happens or give you the example of the last time you saw that, you actually find out there were clear antecedents that this has been building up over the over the day. There'd been an argument the previous night which had set the tone for um, an escalation of a particular kind of behavior, which with hindsight had clear antece antecedents uh, or conditions which facilitated that behavior happening. Next slide, please. Um, behaviors which are more likely to be brain injury related are those which are severe or unusual for the child's age those which are invariant to context, so they happen anywhere. So it doesn't matter if you're out with friends, you don't care how embarrassing this is or how socially um, um, divisive your behavior is. There are no evident antecedents. Nothing appears to happen beforehand. This comes totally out of the blue and there is no apparent remorse or recollection of that experience whatsoever. All of those features don't have to be present, but the presence of some of those in some form would suggest more brain injury related drivers for that behavior less likely to be brain injury related, all the converse um, characteristics, modest, typical behavior, modest aggression, heavily context dependent. You do this at home in front of your parents, you swear and uh, act physically aggressively towards them, but you don't do so with other people's parents and you certainly don't do so at school. All of these behaviors have clear antecedents and you express insight. One of the questions that I'm fond of asking parents clinically is, OK, so your five year old, six year old, seven year old screams for an ice cream. What happens if you do the worst thing that the textbooks tell you never to do? Just give in and give them the ice cream. And I'm reassured sometimes when the parents will say, actually, that would completely, even though we've never done it, we imagine that would completely calm them down. That the child is able to regulate their behavior and the behavior is driven by a desire to achieve a reward. And when that's given, uh, that's the end of the episode. Next slide, please. Um, specific behavioural disorders are linked to underlying brain dysfunction. So psychopathy is a form of a behavioural description rather controversial around manipulation, deception, emotional superfic superficiality, lack of empathy and remorse, impulsive and, and irresponsible lifestyle. Episodic discontrol is an important um, uh, issue to recognise, which is often a, or I wouldn't say often, which is a feature of brain injury often linked to um, Ep underlying epilepsy and results in extraordinary violence, aggressive outbursts, which appear to have no um, uh, particular precipitating factors. Can I have the next slide, please? Traumatic brain injury in childhood tends to result in a gradual emergence of difficult behavior. And this is often taken as a, as a, as a manifestation of the fact that the, when the frontal lobes are reaching maturity and when a child is beginning to take risks, the regulatory mechanisms are not in place to allow appropriate behavior regulation to happen. Next slide, please. Uh, there's a great couple of um, studies. I'm not going to read these out, but they're showing exactly this point. Um, um, young children, this is a 20 year old who was run over by a vehicle at 15 months and had this kind of pattern of sort of bifrontal uh, brain injury. Um, resulting in a particular form of risky and socially inappropriate behavior in adolescence. Next slide, please. Another case of a child who had a right frontal brain tumor removed at the age of three months and largely made a good recovery. But by the time they were nine, they were showing a lack of motivation, outbursts of anger, consuming large quantities of food and later became obese, engaged in reckless financial behavior, sexually irresponsible behavior, etc. Next slide, please. Is it more complicated than this? Of course, the answer is yes. Next slide, please. Um, Pre-injury factors are linked to risk of injury. So um, if you go, I got my daughter one of these uh, sort of uh, hoverboards, I think they're called for Christmas. Uh, if you uh, look at the next slide, please. 
Uh, what she didn't do is use it on a set of steps as this uh, young person did, which inevitably results in the next uh, image, which is an injury. We know that children with ADHD make bad choices about risk taking in early and mid childhood and indeed into adolescence. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, we also know that head injury isn't uniformly distributed with regard to um, uh, gender. So this is just showing the disproportionate uh, preponderance of males in head injury statistics. Uh, so that's the top line. Next slide, please. And this is just showing socioeconomic status is, is uh, an inf strongly um, influences the risks around head injury. Next slide, please. Uh, children with ADHD show a much higher risk of injury, and this is just showing lifetime ADHD and the kind of risks uh, to which having ADHD or attentional deficits in general would expose you to. Next slide, please. Head injury itself, as, a, as an outcome of risk taking in some circumstances, although not all clearly, um, uh, this is just showing the age distribution of head injuries um, in Southwest England, a study done by um, Phil Yates, um, and just showing although most injuries are mild, so the blue figures, um, uh, very few are moderate to severe, most head injuries that occur in childhood occur in the 15 to 19 age group. Next slide, please. We also know that there is an explosion of mental disorders, mental health problems in children at around the same time. So between age 11 and 16, and this is looking at mental disorders that would include behavioral disorders. So it, it's, it, is, it is normally the case that adolescents, even those without brain injury, would show uh, an increased risk of um, any form of behavioral or psychological or mental health disorder between the ages of 11 and 16. Next slide, please. Uh, this is showing the same kind of data. Um, if you look at the bottom left, you'll see an x-axis showing age and the peak um, onset of new disorders, whether that's anxiety, ADHD, schizophrenia, mood disorders, also during adolescence. And this is in individuals who have not suffered a brain injury. So even without brain injury, clearly there are risks to an adolescent population of the onset of a disorder, which heralds lifelong risks in terms of the continuity of those mental health and behavioral problems. Next slide, please. So how do we reconcile the complexity? Next slide. Well, we know, for example, I think Laura talked about a young person who'd had a severe injury. We know that severe injuries are the vast minority of injuries, traumatic brain injuries that happen to children. Most injuries are mild. It is likely that mild injuries are less likely to result in intractable behavioral and psychological problems. It's much more likely that severe injuries will result in the kind of damage to underlying structure and function that would result in compromised behavioral regulation. Next slide, please. So amplified risks um, um, for a uh, for a child exhibiting um, difficult behaviour would be um, uh, a presence of a mild, moderate, or severe learning disability. So we don't need to posit specific um, structures within the brain which are broken in order to be able to understand that having a severe learning disability or a moderate learning disability predisposes you to challenging behaviour. We know that. We know that about individuals without brain injury who exhibit the same kind of cognitive impairment. So cognitive factors like inhibitory control, behavioural regulation are compromised in the same way that your global uh, learning is compromised. And if you're faced with additional communication difficulties, getting your wants known to others, getting your needs met is a challenge. If you're additionally dependent upon the physical support from others and you have a communication and learning disability, these are all factors which would contribute to a significant risk of a lifelong challenging behaviour. Qualitatively distinct from that are discrete areas of damage to the brain, so epilepsy related frontal lobe epilepsy, for example, leading to explosive um, episodes of challenging behaviour or severe and specific impairments to control or regulatory mechanisms, so damage to mesial temporal structures like the amygdala might lead to specific circuit related deficits in cognitive functioning. But we can see the pathology on scans, we can see the pathology on metabolic studies or functional imaging studies, which allows us then to predict that this form of behaviour is driven by a particular form of dysfunction in the brain. I'm going to speed up a little bit. I know I'm going very fast, but there'll be time to explore some of these themes and questions. Next slide, please. We make attribution biases when we're judging acceptable behaviour. 
if I use my phone, it's all right. If my child uses her phone, I'd ask her to, to, to put it down and switch it off while we're at the dinner table. Um, so I make different judgments. I'm a hypocrite, as my eldest tells me. Uh, next slide, please. We make a fundamental attribution error, and I invite you to, if you're happy with the swearing in the video, to watch this um, scene from Seinfeld, which brings a lot of the ideas together that I've talked about today. The fundamental attribution error is that when we're judging someone else's behavior, if it's a positive behavior, we believe it's down to circumstances. But when we make the judgment about our own behavior, we regard that positive behavior as intrinsic to our warm and positive personality. If there's a negative behavior that's, that's being uh, questioned, if that is a behavior exhibited by ourselves, we regard that as down to circumstances. I shouted or I swore because I was particularly stressed and I'd had a difficult day. Whereas you swore or shouted because you have personality problems. So that's the kind of bias that allows us to feel comfortable with ourselves, but also make inappropriate judgments about others. And we do the same in relation to brain injury. Next slide, please. Um, there's a great um, um, theory about um, locus of control, which is um, illustrated here that, um, that, that, that we can either make judgments which are about stable factors or unstable factors internal, with internal or external drivers. So if we're talking about negative behavior, an example of an unstable external factor would be bad luck, whereas a stable internal factor would be inability. I did that bad thing because I'm unable to do it. A stable external factor would be the task itself was difficult. It will always be difficult. The reason I failed with this task is because of those stable external factors. And finally, a stable internal factor would be poor effort. So the reason I failed with that task was because I wasn't making an effort at that particular moment in time. Next slide, please. I think it's a, a so brain injury drives this towards the top left of the diagram. So stable internal factors, the structure or function of the brain is causing um, um, the behavior. Next slide, please. I just want to credit some work that was done uh, by colleagues, uh, Peter Tucker and James Hanley. Peter uh, was at both the University of Bath and uh, the RNHRD in the um, in Bath um, City, um, but also works for Ricolo and maybe some practitioners from Ricolo here today. Um, he characterizes behavior which is more likely to be attributed by staff to brain injury as comprising things like in blue here, physical aggression towards self or others, sexualized behavior, fecal smearing or obsessive, obsessive eating and, and non-brain injury related judgments were made about behavior which was around non-compliance or verbal rather than physical aggression, lack of engagement or motivation. Next slide, please. They also looked at the extremeness of behavior and the corresponding judgments made by staff. So the more extreme the behavior, the more likely it was to be judged by staff as being brain injury related. Next slide. In terms of control, they um, described this young person who was shouting and swearing with little old ladies in the lift and would say, oh, sorry, immediately express remorse, but continue to exhibit the behavior with a semblance of lack of control. Another feature of brain injury related difficult behavior. Next slide, please. And in terms of appearance, people who look well, who look normal, who may have had a brain injury, um, we're more prone to making attribution biases around um, their behavior being non-brain injury related. And finally, next slide. Normality. I think if they've had a brain injury, sometimes we say, well, look, they've got a brain injury. And actually, when you look at it, we think they're just behaving like normal teenagers. So there again, there are biases towards recognizing normal teenage behavior in terms of the form and function of the behavior that we see being exhibited by a person who's nonetheless had a brain injury. Next slide, please. A pragmatic approach. And I've just got two more slides, if you can bear with me. Um, behavioral approaches to the treatment of brain injury tend to tend to work regardless of whether the behavior is brain injury based or not. And that's because if the factors are around the, 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 um, the, the cognitive limitations, generally speaking, issues around um, um, reduced behavioral regulation, but not absent behavioral regulation, then a consistent and clear approach to behavioral management will ultimately work. But they're costly to get right and require careful and lifelong consistent management in the right environment. Next slide, please. From a legal perspective, the cost of individual treatment of a behavioral disorder might be of the order of £4,000 in terms of psychology costs. But in the most extreme situation, we might be looking at lifetime costs of two to one care, the importance of having a stable and highly trained staff group within an appropriate environment and appropriate risk management. 
There's often an argument about discrete management, so the treatment of an individual behavior, which is a one-off treatment, versus a lifelong management plan. And in cases of learning disability and acquired brain injury resulting in dysregulation of behavior, it's much more likely that you require not a one-off treatment, but the maintenance of a program and an infrastructure, which is both costly, but needs to be, and it's costly because it needs to be sustained over a long period of time across a variety of settings and in response to a variety of challenges that an individual might experience. Use, next slide, please. So thank you. I've arrived at the end at 13.01, so I'm very happy to, to join you in the, in the lobby or the uh, breakout rooms and have some further discussion of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Wright, for uh, this fascinating topic. And you know, 1301, you are you are definitely on time. So thank you for sticking to time uh, as well. Um, well, look, um, thank you all for joining us. Um, there are uh, three matters I want to um, raise with you um, in the live event Q and A under the published stream. You will have the link to the video that um, we uh, couldn't show you because of, of a. A bit of swearing, but definitely worth um, a watch. Um, secondly, there are feed. There's a link to our feedback forms, and again, if you could take two minutes to complete those and send them back, I'll be very grateful. Um, and finally, uh, as can be expected, we have had loads of questions, um, uh, so both before and during uh, today's main webinar. Um, there are quite a few um, attendees uh, with us and we expect quite a vibrant discussion going through uh, all of these questions. But if you want the answers, then you have to join us in the networking room and the link has been posted again in the published uh, feed um, section uh, and that will take you straight into a next um, Teams room where you'll be able to see each other and have a bit more interaction with Professor Wright. So I'll invite all of you to switch over to that platform. It will be moderated by my colleague Rhys Dando uh, and, and um, Professor um, Ingham Wright uh, will kindly also uh, attend that session to answer all of your questions. So thank you once again uh, and that's it from me. See you on the other side. Thank you Laura. Thank you. <laughs>